this short documentary series on the humanities in Europe today, uh, which starts from Europe but will expand to cover, I hope, the whole world, is the initiative of the European network of humanities centres and institutes. We decided collectively with our colleagues that it would be a good idea to present a series of portraits of leading figures in the humanities in our part of the world and to use them as sources of inspiration, as role models, if you wish, for practitioners and students alike. The portraits of this very sort of charismatic, highly accomplished, distinguished professionals accomplishes another aim. It allows us to trace a genealogical sort of portrait of where the humanities have been, where they are at today and where they could go, insofar as each person that we interview is asked to trace their own itinerary, past, present and future. And simply by asking a question like, what was your faculty called when you studied as an undergraduate? And noticing the semantic, the institutional, the political transformations that the field has gone through. Just by doing that, I think the viewers should be in a position to measure the extent of the changes and the extent of the vitality of the field. The hope of this mini-series is indeed that we can collectively as practitioners but also as spectators express our love for, our trust in, our respect for this amazing field of the humanities at a time in its history when it is coming under attack in the press, in the public debate, um, in policy making and financial decisions that are really penalizing this field. The humanities in the 21st century as you will see in the different portraits of these great figures we're offering to you, are a vital, vibrant, critical, creative, extremely accountable field, proud of its history, confident of its place in the world, and very hopeful for the future. We really hope that you will enjoy uh, watching these great figures, and maybe you will be yourself tempted to run out and interview somebody that you know in your own neighborhood, in your own circles, because the humanities are everywhere and for everybody. I was very much from the beginning a humanist, I'd say. I started studying um, history, history of mentalities in Rotterdam at the faculty of, I guess it was history back then, I'm not entirely sure, um, from 2001 until 2004. Then I did a MA in media and journalism at the same faculty, which I thought was very unsuccessful. Um, I did then an MA in philosophy, which I got funded halfway, and so I worked for Hank Oseling as a part of the deal. Then I got a scholarship to go to the UK, where I studied film and TV at the University of Warwick. And then I got a scholarship to um, either stay at Warwick or to go to the University of Reading, which is what I then did. From a young age, of course, I had other plans, like becoming a football player or something. But from the moment I realized that I was very poor at many, many things uh, and I was half decent at reading books and watching films and going to art shows, I realized that I, I, I had found my niche. I don't have a youth, I would say. Uh, my parents are not, they don't necessarily go to, to any venues or something. But I think um, halfway during high school, I started especially going to, to museums and exhibitions that I, I found interesting if I was in a, in a big city. I'm not from a big city myself. Um, and I started reading. I think my first real love was literature in that sense. I started reading massively everything I could get my hands on. It was available and so I, had a, I developed a very big love for literature. And then once I went to university and started living in Rotterdam and then later in London um, and, and musea and especially galleries, commercial galleries and off spaces became available. I started adding to my love for literature a, a deep love for um, for the fine arts, I guess you could say. Um, I initially started history because I found that I wanted to develop my own kind of language historically, and then philosophy because I wanted to do the same thing. And so gradually, I guess I started to combine my interest for historical processes with those loves for literature and the arts. <laughs> so I'm currently working at the Radboud University in the Department for Cultural Studies in the Faculty of Humanities. Um, which I think is a perfect fit for me because it allows me to combine all my, all my loves and my interests. Um, I would say that my interest, my focus on the arts 
although it has slowly been seeping into my academic practice, is still very much part of what I'm doing when I'm not writing or, 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 or teaching academic subjects. Um, it's very much still a topic that I try to pursue with, with, a, lot of, with a great passion, I, I think, um, to pursue in different means. Um, and I think that's two reasons. The first is that I'm, I don't think I'm equipped in the same way that art historians are equipped to write about art academically, uh, because it's not, my, it's not my niche, I haven't been trained in it, and so I'm a bit of an autodidact in that sense. Uh, but secondly, also because I feel that uh, writing about contemporary arts, I, I love the, the speed of the writing. I'm very much, I very much appreciate the extent to which in magazines and in blogs, you have the ability to, to react directly to things as they are occurring. Uh, to reflect directly on processes as they are happening in the arts and in their relationships uh, to other fields. Um, the extent that it's been seeping into my, my academic practice is via a back door, so to say. Um, not, not as criticism, but more as a, as a sign of the times. I'm trying to also understand contemporary art um, in terms of what it may say about contemporary culture at large. I actually think universities should be slower. I think we should probably have more time to read and we should have more time to, um, to, to work on books and on articles and develop them further. I occasionally do feel that something is, is leaving me too soon uh, before I'm, I'm fully happy with it. And I, so I actually think this slowness is something we should savor. Um, and I think if there's one space in society today where we can still have this, this cultural critical exchange um, where we can, we can actually think and talk about things without them need, needing to be cost-effective instantaneously, it's the university. And so I also feel this is something I really want to savor, this idea of having this slow space here, which is not to say that universities or academics cannot respond to processes as they are, as they are happening, because of course they have venues for that as well. But I do also do feel that this, this idea of slowness, of having the time to let ideas sink in or to debate it, to discuss it, is something uh, quite wonderful really. I, I feel um, that I hop um, between television studies and film studies, my, my, one of two of my big loves also, between arts writing, uh, between historical methodologies, between philosophy light methodologies, um, in order to try and triangulate or map out different patterns across. And I think methodologi methodologically I'm really quite flexible as well, which might make me a very particular kind of scholar, I guess. Um, I'm not, I'm not a, as, as thorough, I would say, a philosopher as, as you are or as Hank Oseling was, my, my teacher, or Jos de Mul even. Um, so I think I'm a different kind of, of thinker, maybe someone who's, who constantly hops from field to field um, trying to relate these practices to one another rather than sitting in, in, in one space and, and understanding something fully. I don't think I have the capabilities to do that. So Metamodernism is a project that uh, does, uh, a good friend of mine, Robin van der Acker, and I started a few years ago. The term is not new, the term has been around for ages, I think, uh, since the 70s or 60s or maybe even, I don't know, 1900s, uh, in Holland, amongst others, by Henk Slager, um, who is also working in Utrecht. But we tried to find a term, or at least a label, um, that we could use to understand the post-postmodern condition, to understand those developments, those strategies, those new um, um, phenomena that were occurring that we found we could no longer explain, that we could no longer contextualize or map with the vernacular that we have learned as students um, about postmodernism. So it was very much a project that started from that, that discrepancy. We found that something was happening, and yet at the same time, we didn't have the words to describe what was happening. And so although some of the practices were very well explained by Lyotard or by Derrida, there was also something different about them. And so we were looking at what could explain that difference. And metamodernism is the very imperfect placeholder, I guess, uh, the label for that new language that we're trying to develop. I, I feel, looking back, um, it's been shaky academically with lots of younger academics, I feel, um, feeling some kind of affiliation to it, even if they don't like the term. But also in the more established uh, circles, I feel there's definitely some skepsis, which I think is only good as well. Um, but outside of academia, it's been more positive. So in popular culture, and especially the arts world, uh, we feel it's really been picked up. So there's, there's a slight difference there somehow, which I guess is also very good. I will, on the one hand, I will very much want to keep studying television and, and film. Um, 
academically, very much as a sort of academic process, speciality in film and TV, but within the, the realm of thinking about arts and thinking about um, cultural theory, I'd like to develop these kinds of ideas of algorithm and new depthiness um, further. I think metamodernism is an interesting project, but I feel it's also got its limitations, and I'd like to, to, yeah, to try and think through some of these new conceptions, which also point to new directions within the art. So it's a, it's a cultural mapping. I think both my academic practice to an extent and this, this semi-journalistic practice are very much involved, not in coming up with new systems of logic, not in coming up with new ideas. I wish I could, but I don't think I'm, I just have the skills for that. But we're trying to map, trying to chart some of these developments that I see happening across the different disciplines and use some of those, those philosophical models that others have developed to understand what's going on. So it's very much a mapping, I would say, of contemporary culture. And that's also what I'd like to do in the future, I would say now at least. Thanks. The TV in firm, that's for me something that's firmly only within the academic. It's a, it's a thing that I, I only feel at this moment. I'd like to do academically to understand cinematic and televisual languages in terms of aesthetics, which I think is an important field, and philosophy. And then the new depthiness, the altogorithm, metamodernism is that sort of overlap um, and Within the academia, I think I'd like to, to really take the time to expand on those concepts, understand if they're viable at all, if they're worthless. Uh, and within, um, within the journalistic practice, I'd very much like to, to see it happening, I guess, to, to try and develop it there, really via um, confrontations and dialogues with the works that I'm seeing and with the practices that are happening. If I could come up with a name um, for the department of my dreams, the department that I'd like to work, to be honest, I, I kind of feel it would be something along the lines of cultural studies of cultural theory. I like very much the idea uh, of an interdisciplinary research crossing the different cultural spheres to understand what links them and what differentiates them from another. Um, which is not to say that I think all should be cultural studies. I'm, I was at a film department uh, for a very long time at Warwick and Reading, and I loved it. I loved that people were just focusing on film, and I think those uh, specific disciplines should be should be um, still in place, should really definitely be in place. Um, but I also feel that there should be spaces where people are trying to to link, to map between these disciplines. And so for me, um, I don't know. I didn't expect I would say this, but yes, I guess I'm I'm very happy at the cultural studies department. I, I mean, I'd hope that my work is generous, um, um, both to the cultural practices I describe and to the scholars whose theories I, I, I use in order to understand contemporary culture. Um, I'm certain that there are scholars who will feel that I'm not generous enough to them and that there's others that hopefully will feel that I'm doing them just. Um, but I'd, I'd like to see it as a generous, generous practice. I mean, I think the new deptiness, of course, is very much an homage also to Jameson. Um, for me at least, and um, um, metamodernism we've built on, I think, many great people. Uh, for example, Jules de Mil, one of my former teachers, who we really took the oscillation theme from, uh, Raoul Eschelman. I think, so I'm hoping that we're, we're being generous in that sense, if that's what you mean. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I guess in a sense I'm paying debt. I'm uh, paying debt. The idea with the labels is the labels always come at the end. There's this observation, and for me this is always a sort of the most interesting thing. If I go to an art show, an exhibition, or if I read a book, and there's these moments, these these little instances that I cannot place at all. I've got incredible difficulties trying to find some kind of vernacular for, and then I begin to see them in different spaces. And so that's for me always the moment that I find that something is very exciting, that something interesting is going on. And so I'm trying to understand by going to different theories that might help me to get to it. And the case of the new deptiness, Jameson, of course, really came into view with this idea of deptlessness. And then Stephen Colbert, the comedian, was so lovely because he works with, this, with the truthiness, a truth that isn't a truth. And so here, um, those two guys then somehow <laughs> came together and the new deptiness as a term came out, which it might be terrible, might be good but it then came out as a, as a result. So the label is also kind of at the end of, the, of that process. What I love about academia, and I think what I also love about the more creative writing that I'm doing outside of academia, is that moment that you're half understanding a work, or that you're half understanding a text. So you read this book and you're not entirely sure yet what is going on. You're kind of touching upon those edges. And those for me are those magical moments that you're suddenly thinking oh, something is happening and you haven't yet found out what and so you read on and then hopefully at one point you understand the book maybe you'll never fully understand it or you look on at other artworks but that moment for me that first moment that intuition that you have understand something and you, something is somehow reshuffling in your head you suddenly see these these things opening up for me that's the 
I don't know, that sounds maybe very corny, but that's always the magical moment of, of academia for me.